I think we're on. We're live. Hey, everybody. It's Laura Eisenhower. I'm here with some of the speakers uh, that spoke and shared at the two-day event that we just wrapped up. And boy, was it amazing. Just so much incredible information. And I believe it's, uh, Neil, before you go, it, it's something they can still purchase even after the fact, correct? The evolution of uh, consciousness. So uh, there's quite a few videos that we put out, but look at the information that we're gonna put in the description. If you weren't able to show up, you can still purchase. This is how it's been with most of the events I've done with uh, Portal to Ascension. And you have constant replays and there's just so much material there. And uh, it was really great to just be with uh, you guys. And we've got Augie Nost, who is the co-creator of this event, uh, along with uh, Neil and I. And we have Elena Danon and Nori Love. And we're just going to talk about whatever the audience is really calling out for. We got a Q and A here. I'm gonna read some questions and just go around to everybody and see what um, y'all have to say. And I'd love to hear your thoughts about um, your experience at the event as well. Um, all right, so I, I might just start at the bottom and go up now that we're on the panel. So uh, on a personal basis, are there any specific signs, patterns, degrees and or planets that are highly significant or powerful, which we should look for in our natal charts. Um, yeah, I mean, I'll just answer that real quick. Um, some of these will probably be geared towards the presentation I just did. So I can answer those maybe through email, but yeah, let's uh, get some questions going for the panel. That would be awesome. But let me quickly, you know, answer that. Yeah, absolutely. Um, there's all sorts of things um, that are significant especially when a person has like a stellium of planets, like a lot of planets next to each other. Um, there are all sorts of different configurations like grand trines or um, grand square, you know, there, there are different uh, factors that are going to stand out. And sometimes uh, some of the challenging aspects can be so strong that it's hard to feel the, the ones that um, flow on an easier level. It's almost like a challenge or a life lesson you have to get over before you really start to enjoy some of the other aspects and qualities of what the chart holds, but that's all a part of self-discovery till we get into that zero point unified field and we're not so ruled by all these different things. The challenges help us to get there just as much as the blessings, of course. And I was talking about the initiatory planets. Um, so, and, and you can definitely check that out on a replay of this event. So uh, anybody have any questions or anything jumping out? Let's kind of go around and just say hi to everybody and uh, any thoughts or reflections on the weekend or the last two days. We'll start with you, Augie, and then Elaine and uh, Give me just a little more. I saw Daniel Winter here and I'm trying to get him in on the panel. So um, give me a few seconds and I oh. can. So Elena, what are your thoughts? Well, I've been very impressed by all the talks and it was quite amazing to have so many people in different fields really uh, bringing guidance and enlightenment about all these topics. It was quite amazing. I, I learned um, a lot of things myself too. Um, I was particularly impressed by um, Daniel, uh, uh, Daniel Winter's talk, and um, I was hoping to share with him. I think he's, he's coming um, some um, personal thought, thought I had about what he, he said. Um, yeah, so if, if he comes back, uh, I'll, uh, oh, I'll yeah, yeah, share yeah. with him. Yeah, I think it's, nice yeah, the, it was great. <laughs> it was great. Yeah, so one of the things that I'm like, just really happy about is that a few kiss season is a big deal. And anybody who hasn't heard of that, um, it's, it's really important to understand it's between uh, November 30th to December 17th. And it's, it's such an incredible opportunity for healing. Uh, the sun started to move through the 13th sign in 2010. I, I know I bring it up so much that I'm like, oh my God, I'm saying it again. But I, got, I went into a lot of detail in the presentation and I think it'll just really be encouraging uh, to be reminded of what properties and qualities uh, this particular sign holds, how it corresponds with our capacity to turn everything else around everything around on this planet, really. I know that seems almost like an impossible thing. It's not gonna be the same for everyone, but um, all these different talks, I would definitely uh, 
um, purchase to hear all of them. I enjoyed every single one of you so immensely. And um, Dan, I want to connect you with Elena. She, uh, after listening to your talk, has a few words that she wanted to share. Hi there. Happy to. Sure. <laughs> Oh, I, I was very impressed uh, listening to you. I learned a lot of things and I was like jumping on my seat like, oh, my God. Oh, my God. Um, I want to share with you some personal feedback about some some things you said. Um, I was in, you know, I, I have I'm a contactee and I, I have sometimes um, it is giving me some some information and some interesting stuff. And um, I, I want to show you this. I um they gave me the propulsion of a ship, uh, oh, yes. basic propulsion, yes, with mm -hmm. uh, two, it's two toroids, one in the other. This one is, this donut is inside of it. So there are two layers like this. Mm -hmm. yes. And there's, uh, so that creates anti-gravity. So, and um, the, they put very, uh, they put mercury or uh, other kind of um, liquid metals um, at very high pressure, ex insanely high pressure and insanely high heat. And the two toroids turn at, um, the, you know, square angle. One turns like this and one turns like this. And it, it's creating gravity. Then um, I had a talk with a French scientist, uh, Chris Esson, and he said to me, you know what he said, in uh, crashes of ET, uh, extraterrestrial crafts, there, is, there was this red liquid coming, leaking out. And uh, he said, if you say it's, you, there is mercury in these toroid generators, it could be mercury iodide because it's uh, ion negative. It's ion negative because I, 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 as I've been told, it uh, it spins counterclockwise, and uh, so it it's negative ions. I I'm not a scientist. That's, I just repeat what I'm being told. So, what do you does it does this make sense to you? We we published uh, papers on the equations to optimize the ver mercury vortex. It's at fractalfield.com slash propulsion. Actually, the red color is because an iron powder dopant is used with a very special solvent to make it soluble in the mercury. The function is that the mercury provides the inertial uh, uh, translation of vorticity for pure inertial density. However, for magnetic flux density, you need a dopant like iron, which iron powder, that's what made it red actually. But the high oh. pressure is correct. The reason for the perpendicular, uh, in, in this case is not directly conjugating, the two uh, are creating the capability to create a thrust vector in perpendicular directions actually. But the, the key to how gravity is made is the angle of traverse down that vortex uh, has to approximate a conjugate angle, as in when Victor Schauberger did it with a simple piezo-doped water vortex, actually. Uh, so the, but the physics of why a vortex makes gravity is central to my life's work, all of which is at fractalfield.com slash conjugate propulsion. For example, practical example, when you hold one Hebrew letter in your mind, as a rabbi does creating a golem, what it does is it controls the phase or tilt angle of the plasma vortex in your optical cortex. And aside from being a source of energy, it is actually a propulsion vector. So mm -hmm. once you know why an object falls to the ground, then it's immediately obvious how a vortex makes gravity. This became evident after we the new equations we have, which predicted that this is in fact the structure of hydrogen. Take the Planck threshold with the musical key there, and use golden ratio exponents, you predict the orbital radii of hydrogen, proving that hydrogen itself is built that way, like a conjugate of a fractal vortex. So vortex theory of gravity is central to what we're doing. And by the way, that is, that's what was called um, impulse power in Star Trek. What they called warp propulsion is a bit more advanced where they use a, uh, uh, well, in Kosky Frost, it was a piezoelectric crystal but in Star Trek, they called it uh, the lithium niobate. The lithium, yeah. And actually, lithium niobate is a phase conjugate dielectric, and it is a phase conjugate pump wave. The reason is that rotating conjugators make gravity. It's a bit of the advanced stuff. But actually, it's a slinky that the pump wave is converting the vortex 
And that implosion literally warped space. So no, that, that all is at that article. We, we have a lot of people that are involved in these things. Happy yeah, to creates, see that. Uh, so would you say it creates a singularity? Well, singularity is a decent term for it. Once you learn the key signature is tuning to Planck, the yeah. singularity is the Planck threshold at which the transverse electromagnetic is converted into longitudinal EMF. And even Bearden's equations prove that's the substance of a gravity wave. Basically, the gravity wave is the compressional wave that is squirted out the center of the squirt gun at the Planck threshold. And singularity, even Nassim calls that a kind of a black hole. And it is. It's because implosion is making gravity. The interesting thing is, you rotate a conjugator like that, like a carbon nano of sufficient purity, it makes both energy and propulsion. And it does make all energy and propulsion on this planet look like the Stone Ages. <laughs> yeah, totally. Wow. Thank you wow. very much. Wow. That's awesome. Um, wow. Do we have a question if you guys are ready for that? It says, dear panel, first of all, thank you for sharing such amazing knowledge. Since I've been activated, I know that my mission is to heal the elements, nature, animals, and I'm ready, already healing people with music. What resources would you recommend to expand my knowledge and gifts? I'm currently diving into metaphysics to apply and understand the science, but any suggestions would be appreciated. And yes, I'm working to increase my frequency. So I would rather just like let anybody who's ready for, to answer just jump right in. Oh, I could. Uh <laughs> Uh, I could, <laughs> and uh, I would, um, I would really, first of all, I'm going to say we have had people from all over the globe on this conference, and I'm looking through the list of the people that is here, and I see one, Ose Evebø, that, looking at that name, it's got to be a Norwegian, so uh, I would say to her, uh, uh, welcome to conference, and what is it, so glad to add her, so that, that was for her especially. If you understood it, you speak Norwegian. All right. <laughs> and uh, I had so much fun doing this. And, uh, you know, there are some incredibly sharp people here. And I would say for the people that has been listening to this, uh, join us on Facebook and on social media and go to our website and just stay in touch because it doesn't end here. There is more knowledge, there's more wisdom and information coming and it could be coming in subtle ways where maybe we just say something in a show somewhere that you can catch and you can apply it to your life to make your life better. And uh, I, I know that because it happens to me all the time and I listen to people, you know, it's just plain and simple. You know, God made me one mouth and two ears and we should use them accordingly. And I try, it doesn't work all the time, but I try. So um, I, uh, for those of you that uh, wanna hear about uh, astral travel and how to reverse the aging process as the Nobel prize were given for its discovery, but nobody told us you can go back into the recording here and listen to what I talked about here um, yesterday. And also I would say, make contact. I am totally available to anybody that buy my books or um, contact me on Facebook. And so I, I spend 12, 16 hours a day working and I love talking to people. So just come and make a contact. And I don't know. I, I want to hear more from people that are smarter than me. So you guys got it. Actually, I, I, had, I had a question for Elena, if possible. Uh, uh, Elena, when, when um, Michael Sala on ExoPolitics said that the Super Galactic Federation representatives mm -hmm. at Ganymede uh, were, in fact, the return of Enki and the Nine, did that information come from you or Megan Rose? And do you have any comment about what that means in your view? Yes, it was coming from me, actually. Um, and, uh, well, I haven't been told that Enki was the same thing as the Intergalactic Confederation. I haven't been told it really. I, I, I knew Enki uh, was back. But Enki is not maybe especially a being. It's maybe, you know, a group or concept or something. And the Intergalactic Confederation, it's... it's uh, um, a, federation of different uh, galaxies, in fact. 
and it's a culture that's extremely old. I know they're like 20,000 years old, older in advance technologically, kind of this. this. Um, the nine yes. are... Uh, the nine. So I, I was told about the nine and suddenly, you know, it made me Star Trek. That looks like it. But OK, the nine are nine supra consciousnesses. They are not incarnated. They are like huge. That's like you, you mentioned that plasmic consciousnesses. I would relate to this same thing. So I how I've been described is that they do not live in in they live in the void it's something it's called the void they live in the void not in space not in time not in a di dimension they live in between all of this um they can be everywhere at the same time they can shape shift they can communicate they can take human form to communicate to people they can take any shape um and the in the intergalactic confederation relates to them it's like their spirit guides their gods you know, uh, and so they are in the best way to describe where they are and what they are. It's like they are in the void. I've been told uh, this word void. So um, that's Were you aware are. With, when um, Andre Puharik, uh, it, it, the only planet of choice and talked about those communicating with him were called the nine. I knew him quite okay. well. And yeah. that's actually where they got the idea of the deep space nine mm. uh, Mm. series and the deep space nine interestingly the theme was that the black hole which was actually a transport device was actually turned out to be mindful and had intent so here is an interstellar plasma vortex called the black hole and later they find out that it's mindful and has intent talk about plasma intelligences so there's a big history toward talking about the nine in the science fiction literature it came from andrew Poharik, who was quite a story of Anyway, so you might want to compare. Yes, and in Deep, Deep Space Nine, and I I, uh, I advise to watch the episode, The Chase. I've been sent uh, an excerpt from this episode recently yeah. by someone. Yeah. And I went, wow. Yeah, exactly. The, the founders, the founders, yeah. the Caesars. Yeah, the Caesars. The Caesars. Oh, my God. Yes. Yes. <laughs> yes. And, you know, Vincent called those the galactic core cultures. And uh, I think Anton Parks called them the... the, the Kadistu, there's many terms, but basically to understand what makes such an in, a plasma intelligent. For example, Anunnaki tradition was that your position in the political hierarchy, body polis, was in the hierarchy of the nine. So literally they recognized their star ancestors were a giant plasma intelligence characterized yes. as the nine. Yes. That's all yes. over, you know, Sitchin even. <laughs> so there's some great root there. And that became the nine in, in the Egyptian and the <laughs> Yes. Oh, totally. And the Egyptian culture is derived derived from the, the Anunnaki culture, the Mesopotamian yeah, exactly. culture, you know. Yeah. So that I'm totally Is sure. And up in the Ennead? Yes, I, exactly. Thank you. Yes, precisely. Yeah, so in yes. the nine steps of the pagoda and Dante's Inferno, it's all so if we understand more about what makes plasma intelligent at that scale. You know, we know when a million children sang the same song, it was measured 11 times, it affected the solar output. That's a plasma intelligence. Yes, yes, yes. And that's something you mentioned as well when you spoke about whale language or yeah, whale and also, yeah. yes, and also um, like um, ideogram language, like codes. Um, it's a telepathic language that's it's not really telepathy, it speaks, it's like quantum communication and it sends codes made with mathematical equations, images, mm -hmm. um, light, uh, mm -hmm. plenty of things. And that's the language I've been, you know, I met this, I met some uh, beings from this intergalactic confederation. They are not the nine, they're just people, but uh, they were tall whites and they were talking like this. And um, when you hear them, it sounds like the dolphins sounds, but it's, 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 it's all right, it's, it's very nice. But then you receive um, like patches and each, each patch uh, uh, thought has encoded in it. Uh, it's like a holograms, holographic writing like, and it has encoded emotion, a story, uh, visuals, um, words, sounds. Uh, that's the way, they, that's their language. That's and fascinating. 
Yeah, it is. And when, you know, D said the alphabet of the angels was a hypercube, which is Ophana Minokian, then we see that, and that's a superset of the spiral in the Taurus, which made Hebrew. And if you take the sound Aleph, Beit, Gimel, Dalit, and do a power spectra, the frequency signature of the sound of the letter makes the picture of the letter. It's called spectrograms, yes. the Hebrew alphabet yes. by Fred yes. Wolf. Carlos Suarez. So that's an indication that the plasma beings are receiving plasma domains, not just which feed their aura, but their name and their shape and language and service are one. Yes. The physics of language. Last thing, I, I just, uh, today I was reading this book. I don't know if you know it. Oh, yes, I do. I have the book. Listen yes. to that. And that came to me and I just put a little, oh, that, that's interesting. Abba Marash. Anunnaki's spatial transmissions of thoughts on a holographic grid. The thoughts register as codes on an electroplasmic screen or mirror. <laughs> yep. That's cool. Yep. Yes. The Abamarash codes appear in sequences of numbers, usually a multitude of dots and lines. The dots correspond to zero, the line corresponds to one. And that makes language very dense, extremely dense with information. It's a rich it's a vision wow oh Sorry. my god we will yeah let, let us <laughs> another time <laughs> we can go on yes. another <laughs> time <laughs> oh no I, I could be here it's like oh the, the sun's coming up because <laughs> i love listening to you both okay laura, so, laura what, what was that question about healing because i did want to say something yeah. Yes. So she said, uh, since I've been activated, I know that my mission is to heal the elements, nature, animals, and I'm already healing people with music. What resources would you recommend to expand my knowledge and gifts? I'm currently diving into metaphysics to apply and understand the science. Any suggestions would be appreciated. And then let me just uh, plant a seed for the next question about is earth a solid sphere or flat? So get ready for that one, everyone. So go ahead, Nori. So if, if, if you feel drawn, I would certainly um, recommend Reiki. Reiki is such a beautiful, beautiful, beautiful modality. So if, if you feel drawn to it, that's definitely something I would share. That's it. Mm -hmm. Excellent. Who wants to tackle the um, uh, the flat Earth thing? And the, wait, wait. I think I just might have to <laughs> out, out of my realm. <laughs> I think the nutritional component is like super important, and just really, you know, I mean, it, it almost sounds just like okay, nature, nutrition, crystals, essential oils, um, Reiki for sure. That's you know awesome. But there's something about like medicinal mushrooms and some of these uh, supplements um, that are quite extraordinary. And I just wanted to just throw out there, not trying to sell stuff, but I, I only uh, distribute these products because I believe in them and I use them. But if you go to my website, cosmicgaia.org and you look under products, some of the most quality medicinal mushrooms and green foods and superfoods and all sorts of great blends with ashwagandha and chaga. And I mean, ah, I've been exposed to a lot of stuff that could have made me sick and, you know, because of what's going on. And um, because of some of this stuff, I moved through it so quick. And I just wanted to say that that keeps my frequency high and um, it just helps you to be at your most optimal as you're just doing your creative thing. And of course, yeah, nature and um, laughter. And that's all I'll add. I just wanted to, uh, regarding the Reiki, you know, on our goldenmean.info says kit page, we show the Japanese roots of the Reiki symbol, really? uh, which are the shadow of the embeddability of the platonic solids. So the dichomio, for example. Yes. So when you make that symbol, you're actually inviting charge implosion, literally. So wow. the, the, the physics of origin of Reiki. But, and maybe I'll give a just quick, quick 30 second on the hollow earth story or the flat earth story. Um, any planet that evolves from a molten origin a, or a hot origin. Wait, wait, hold will, on. Um, Seth uh, just needs to be let in. Keep going. I'm so sorry to interrupt you. No, Seth, just. If it, you could start from the beginning. I just said that Seth is in the. He's. Yes, to let on. Seth in. Yes. So just to say that we, if a planet is cool, cooling from a molten state or a hot core, it's always going to have major hollow. So it's normal that a big part of the center of planet, and I think the point made by, uh, what's that scientist, that, that, um, that the seismic data and the gravitational data indicate, made, 
yeah, Brooks Agnew, thank you. And so that, that clearly the planet is has been hollow and that's normal. And in fact, there, we, so many people believe there is a form of cold fusion. They call it the, um, the, the misty light inside that it's a form of nickel, uh, copper, cold fusion inside, a bit of light inside. As far as the flat earth, of course, that story makes no sense. But from a shamanic viewpoint, as you perceive the longitudinal array, in, in, in your shamanic longitudinal travels, you could perceive the earth as a plane. So that is a metaphor that still is useful. So that's my comment. Wow, brilliant. Augie, do you see that Seth is there? Really good. Yes. I would say also when it comes to the earth being round, if you take a little, a little bit of a drop of water and you spin it in vacuum, it's going to rotate and it will be round. The faster you spin it, it will just flatten out a little bit at the equator, but it still is round. It cannot turn into a flat uh, surface because we are in space. We are in vacuum. We are a place where there is very little, if any, gravity outside of what is created within the solar system, which is very minor compared to the rotation. So um, I don't know why I even went there, but it, it took care of the, the flat earthers, I hope. I've seen Earth from space, it's a sphere. Yeah. Thank you. Thank Once you. Once you've seen the blue ball, there's nobody that can convince you otherwise. But why do you think the flat earthers are so vicious and mean? I mean, I mean what's the big deal? Yeah. Seriously. Um, uh, Seth is still waiting to get brought on. Um, anyway. I, I don't have the ability to get Seth on the panel, but he's waiting. I want to comment on one thing also, what uh, Daniel was talking about. He mentioned something about the black hole. Um, I don't know, and uh, either for or against what I'm saying here, Dan, please uh, give us your thoughts afterwards. Um, the black hole is really not understood very well by mainstream science, or should I say even Newtonian physics. They really don't have a clue. Um, they think they do, but I think they're off the mark. They're saying that it is so powerful in its gravity that it sucks everything and nothing can escape it. Sure, but then sure. again, uh, NASA just published a paper, uh, I think about a year or two ago, where they saw something was spit out mm -hmm. out of a black hole. So they're talking out of both sides of their mouth and which, which end of the mouth is the true, Daniel? <laughs> well, once you know why an object falls to the ground, then you could have the conversation. And uh, the the physics of gravity is it, what Einstein correctly said was infinite non-destructive compression, but the word is infinite. And what that results in is a sorting phenomena at the center. So Stephen Hawking and others did correctly predict that the black holes would be spitting something out. That's well agreed now. But what is spit out is what I believe is a phase conjugate array, which is evidence the black hole is mindful. And that's a new idea. But the, the evidence yeah. the black hole is mindful is the fact that there is sorting that happens at the core, which is a form of perception. And in fact, the nature of the implosive compression is that only what is phase sorted can survive. For example, the physics of successful death, only shareable wave comes through. So anger cannot pass through death quite literally. Mm -hmm. So what NASA saw was spit out of the black hole. Oh, that's, was that's not well known. It, the black holes, black hole ejections are now commonly accepted. What is ejected? The nature of the increased order of what is ejected Behind that, I believe, is the physics of negentropy, and that is the title of my book. Mm -hmm. Wow, yeah. very, very cool. Um, just trying to see, uh, I'm so sorry to interrupt the conversation, trying to um, uh, say that I can't seem to get Seth in, but we'll work on that. I don't know if he's gonna end up dropping off, but we'll take the next- well, Lauren, Neil is here, can he get Seth in? To, um, Neil's here, so I bet he'll be able to, it might just not have the feature free. Did anybody else want to address that question? I can move on to the next question. Okay. It's about yeah? Okay. Are there any 432 Hertz music recommendations? I don't know what to trust on YouTube, so would like to purchase something recommended. 
we do have a website about the physics of implosion sound sorting out the 432 versus 440 concept in terms of what harmonic series renders the most implosion and therefore the most negentropy. That website is fractalfield.com. I repeat, fractalfield.com slash implosion sound. And you can see the table and the array there that you do get more harmonics in a, a musical scale if you do tune to 432. But the reason for that is basically to tune to implosion. Huh, anybody else? Mm. Wow. There's gotta be some good thoughts in here somewhere. I've, I've gotten a lot of um, frequency music from Spotify and I just go by the way that it makes me feel, you know, if it, if it makes me feel all jangled, it's, it's not good. If it does what it's supposed to do, then um, I continue to listen to it. I agree with Nori. There are a lot of um, alleged 432 music that's supposed to be making you feel good. And then it's different frequency in it. And it just, as you, as Nori said, trust your heart, trust what you feel. What do you feel? How does it make you feel? That's the answer. Well, you see, feeling is part of a language. It's a spiritual language. Uh, what uh, Daniel is talking about, that is the physics of it, but it expresses itself, the way I see it, it expresses itself in a physical reality as a feeling, as a knowing, because we are able to tap into our mind, or should I say, yeah, our mind can tap into the uh, physics that is on the other side of this physical border or veil that we cannot see, but our mind can tap into it through the subconscious, superconscious mind into that universal mind. It is there, it's available, and he's able to explain it and we may not understand the science of it, but we have a way to attach it, to bring it in. And it sometimes show up. We can hear music and tears start flowing. Or we can hear music and suddenly we remember something 23 years, eight months, seven weeks and three days, four hours and two minutes ago. <laughs> that happened at that time when we were listening to that music. It is stored, not just maybe in the brain, but it's stored in the universe and we can tap into it. There is a spiritual language. Mm. The, the, the science of emotion in music literature is called Sentix by Manfred Kleins, the article goldenmean.info slash touch. For example, the change in pressure over time in the touch that says, I love you is a point of maximum pressure at about 0.61 golden ratio into the duration of that event, which sets up an implosion effect. So this perfect hug is actually tantric delayed as a pressure geometry versus the, the touch that says I'm angry with you reaches max pressure at one over seven destructive interference. So you actually learn the language of pressure, which is both touch and sound. Hey, Seth wow. is with us. Hey, you guys, my gosh. Hey, Seth. <laughs> And you know, I came on the perfect time too. You're literally talking about what I love most music. It's one of my most passionate favorite things. And I love that there's the, there's just such an interesting spectrum of perspectives on it from, you know, the science to a more intuitive base. But I love music because I, I'm a vocalist. I'm a musician. I sing, I play music. It's just something I love doing. But even more than that, it's like the real music comes from within, right? And I noticed that being a singer and being a performer and playing and, and really doing it well, I can, if I'm not fully in it, I'm creating a frequency that isn't quite attuned to the possibility that that sound can create. And so I'll feel like my being is not in alignment. The energy I'm creating is not creating good music. But when I own it, when I step right into it, when I'm in love with what I'm doing, all of a sudden I take on this whole other role and I'm like living in the music and it's coming through me in that way. 
whether it's gentle, nice healing music, whether it's heavy metal, I mean, all of it, it works no matter what you do, if you're all in. So, cause we forget, we generate energy. That's what it really comes down to. We generate energy. And when you get really good at being conscious of the part of yourself that is aware that you generate energy, you become very mindful of the type of energy you're generating. And thus you're going to attract things that are going to amplify or increase that or repel it. And yeah, because the music uses its language to speak to you. And not only that music, it's funny. They, there's a saying music can very often say what words cannot, you know, I know yeah. speaking for me, for myself, I know not very little, very, very little. And the more I think I know, the more I find out that I don't really know that much. So it's always this constant process of like, oh my God, I'm beginning to realize, and oh my God, I can sense all these things and it's all making sense. And then all of a sudden, bam, oh, wait a second, it's totally gone, amnesia. And it has a way of doing that to bring you to this place where you're able to sustain a place of humility, of humbleness, of innocence. And I love that. I love that. That's my, my favorite part of, especially music is like the ultimate thing because it takes a lot to stand up, especially to, to sing, you know, to get up in front of a thousand people and sing and use your voice and just with everything you've got, you've got to be so either super egotistical or totally detached from your ego in order for it to work really well. And <laughs> mm -hmm. if any of this makes sense. Yeah, I see this, this, this uh, question by Liana Curtis here. Uh, Anki is a culture is what I heard versus Anu and Enlil, is that your understanding? You know, Zachariah Sitchin wrote a book on Enki, and I wrote a book on Enki, goldenmean.info slash Enki. But then Anton Parks wrote a book on Enki, a whole series of detailed research in which basically says that Enki becomes Ptah Osiris with the green face. And that's a very detailed, and that indirectly is a culture because the name of that bloodline, Thoth, Thothmosis became the name of the bloodline of Jesus, and the name of the bloodline of the royal family of Egypt. So it is a culture and it is a person both actually. I totally yeah. agree. Totally and then agree. the word then Isis, there's something there with yep. uh... as, as the partner of Enki. And, and in the end of the Anton Parks books, Isis is attempting to reassemble the bloodline, the memory of Osiris, Enki, in the orbit of Venus which we now know is a profoundly conjugate pent orbit and planetary orbits are inhabitable when they're conjugate enough. So that's the plasma field of the most fractal planets that can be inhabited by the most intelligent beings. Mm. That's what's the title of that book now? It's called the, the Testimony of the Virgin is the title of that book. Huh. Can I totally throw a curveball into this whole conversation and maybe possibly derail it and just we can all pick up the mess if it happens to. Go oh yeah, so we're answering questions. Um, let do that, and then I'll I'll okay. answer someone uh, who wrote something here. But absolutely, go for it, Seth. And uh, if you all agree. Yeah, I don't. I don't. Maybe I don't know. Maybe a part of me wants to stir things up, but I'll speak for myself. When I allow myself to just be present as I am, and I kind of observe Seth, who Seth has become up to this point so much of who I think I am and what I think of the world is based upon mechanisms of learning that are weren't you could say they weren't really mine to begin with I grew up in a society I was taught this language that we're speaking I was taught to interpret and make sense of information in a very specific way because everybody else does that and everybody else thinks it's normal. And it allows you to become really intellectually intelligent. It allows you to really become over analytically conscious of who you think you are and what you think the world is. 
But then a near-death experience or a super relaxing, like I was saying last night, that state between waking and sleeping, and you begin to become conscious of a part of yourself that you aren't fully conscious of, but it's there. And it's actually more predominant than the part of you that you think you know. And so at what point do we step back and really surrender to that and let it all go? And because I really don't know anything. When I hear people talk in the world, all I hear is like, okay, all these different structures and formats and belief systems and projections of what people think they know. And I sense very little of this feeling of knowingness that's so deeply embedded into the consciousness of an individual that they are emanating it in a way where they are aligned with the greater physical and non-physical structures that everything comes from. You know what I mean? Does that make sense? Yes, absolutely. Embeddability. <laughs> <laughs> Anybody have thoughts on that? You want to share? Oh, I'm sorry, Paul. I said, <laughs> "What's that?" I derailed the conversation. I knew I was gonna, but I just I, you didn't. We we got a lot of questions, and with questions from the audience, it's pretty random. We're not really sticking with any theme, so that was just a cool share. And we'll just go to this question. And see, uh, I don't think it's been read yet. Tell me if it has, because I've been uh, just trying to get you on, and didn't mean to distract everybody. Um, I think I had the capability to, but I couldn't figure it out. So it says, I have been getting biofeedback and body talk sessions and both I have been told that my crown chakra is blocked. Sometimes I feel like there is a brick on my head and when I try to open my crown chakra, it gets really hot. Do you have any suggestions on how I can accomplish this? I have also been told by two different biofeedback practitioners that I am being harshly energetically attacked. I activate my shields every day and they have not been able to attach to me, but this but can this be why I'm having this issue with the crown chakra? And then she says, in my last body talk session, she said I had a protection wall up that was an indigo blue purple color. So this is kind of where it comes back to what I was saying is when you recognize that the predominant bulk of who you think you are is the result of having been influenced by so many others who essentially have been influenced in a way where it's like information has become recycled, reinterpreted, like the telephone game, then you realize that you're getting your information from a second, third, fourth, fifth hand source, like a middleman or middle woman, when really the, the truth of the information, you could say the actual harmonic frequency that ultimately leads to your illumination and liberation comes from you just so devotionally needing to connect with the part of you that feels out of balance. And so when I go, I, you know, I, you, as you know, Laura, I went through a lot. I went through, I had some really serious issues at many points in my life. And there were times when I would go and visit with a lot of different types of healers and psychotherapists and all these people to help me try to make sense of a life that I just couldn't deal with. You know, I couldn't process it. And many people could help to a degree, but then I got to this point where I was like, okay, but there is something causing my heart to beat, causing your heart to beat. And we're talking about everything, but whatever the true nature of that is, and that's going on in us, in nature, it's in the earth, it's above us. It, it, that is a much more predominant factor than everything else that pretty much everybody is talking about. What do we get? How do we get back to reality? So by realizing like, okay, we are in a place where we have been taught that the things that matter matter so much. And the things that really do matter don't seem like they do. I'm going to turn this into a physics talk here by using matter so much. <laughs> but at what point do we say, okay, there's some major missing links and maybe I'm the missing link. Maybe, maybe it isn't somebody or something that has an answer of how I can heal myself as much as it is me just wanting to be the connection 
that I sense is temporarily missing in my awareness of who I think I am and turning that on, activating it, just being so fully present with whatever that is because you can't consciously remember it, that it somehow ignites it. And for me, that has been the only thing that has truly brought me through these dark nights of the ego that we're all going through. And it's funny, we were talking about this the other day. It's, it's not really dark night of the soul as much as it is dark night of the ego. The soul, the soul's like, come on, you guys, wake up. <laughs> like, come on, it's always been here. It's the ego that's like, no, no, I don't want to do that. Okay. So Maybe on the, uh, on the science side of that question, um, biofeedback is my specialty, that in terms of actually addressing specific chakras, some of the most in-depth research has been done by a biologist, uh, Patrick Botti, who is our programmer. We have six biofeedback apps on the app store. And iThrive, I-T-H-R-V-E dot com. The iThrive Chakras app specifically uses medical and biological literature, allowing you to do the breath exercise to tune your heart rate variability. And you can very specifically trigger sequences of glands with that, as you can also using those same harmonics in our plasmafire.com or quantify system, which is some advanced stuff. So there is a biofeedback aspect where you can trigger specific chakras quite specifically, and it does work, it's quite real. But regarding the uh, astral hygiene feeling attack energetically, I wonder maybe Ilana would be good to uh, speak to that one. To, to which one? The, that she feels attacked energetically. Um, right. in terms of Elena, for in terms of the, um, in terms of she feels attacked energetically, do you, maybe you had some suggestions? Yes, uh, if, if she feels attacked energetically, that means there's a breach in her shields, but she uh, can be in her shields, but in her, her protections. But she says that she's working hard on her protections every day. So if the protections are good and always up, there's a bridge somewhere else, you know. Um, you can have a super strong fortress. If you leave a window open, the fortress is useless. And what is a window open? It may be um, a trauma inside or a wound, a weakness that entities have hooked on it and use as a window, maybe fear, maybe pain, maybe sadness, uh, loneliness, something they can use to get in. So I would advise to this person, uh, I don't know, uh, this person who's listening to me, I don't know your story, I don't know you, but my advice would be to uh, try to heal yourself, check up, do a checkup. Do you have traumas? Do you have fears or things like that, that maybe you could heal and then you will feel really strong inside, like a damantine, you know, and... Uh, then you don't maybe even need protections, you know, because you're already strong. So try that, I would say. I've got to interject here. What I love what Elaine is saying, you're like, you're making what you're saying, I'm feeling of like a different way of perceiving this. So if somebody feels like they're being attacked or there's entities, I mean, one way of looking at it is we are an entity, right? We are some kind of bioelectric entity energy entity that is animating a being and when we're not conscious of the potentials that that can represent then we're not a complete entity right we're like an entity, an entity that's weaving in and out of its own wholeness and so we have these open spots that subject us to all this other stuff but the more we work on realizing i am an entity i am animating a form. And the more we work on creating coherence, heart brain coherence, then all of a sudden all of your organs start to form in coherence when your heart and brain are in coherence. Then all of a sudden your entire energy field is in alignment with the coherence that all of your organs, glands and bones and bone marrow and everything are creating together. It's essentially we're like this crystal, you know, it's our, our entire being is a crystal, our physical being, you know, our, our appetite is what our bones are made out of. There's calcium, there's all kinds of crystals all through us. So when we're in alignment, when we're in integrity, and we make that our focus, no matter what, we eventually 
come to a place of fullness where things really can't attack us or hurt us. And it's accompanied by a realization of, God, I love, I love, I love so greatly. I'm so grateful. I love being alive. I'm at like looking at your hand, everything. I know it sounds kind of weird, but you just see everything as like, holy shit. It is a sheer miracle that any of this is happening at all, that any of us are alive. That and like, I mean, really, like when you really, really sit into it and feel it. And so I, that curiosity brings you back to this place where you begin to activate the remembrance of just how miraculous you have the potential to be. And that in and of itself reinforces the entity, the energy field that you are currently temporarily in a way that it just pushes out things that don't support that bit of you that realizes how profound this all actually is. Awesome. Oh, that's awesome. <clears throat> I have something I just really want to share quick, just based on the question. And I'm just going to do a quick share screen. <clears throat> because if this is your crown chakra and you feel attack, I've been focusing a bit on this in my presentations and I just want to show a slide here. Um, So psycho-spiritual warfare is radically increased when a person is entering the integration stages of the seven, eight, and nine of the monadic spiritual triad, because this is who we begin. To, this is when we begin to achieve hierogamos and ascension. This is what was lost in 70 earth. And also when Tiamat exploded, there was no separation from these higher energies. So <clears throat> when we look at the seven chakra system and the crown and what goes beyond the crown, we're, we're talking about an infinity spiral. So the eighth and ninth chakra are not chakras that are just above our head. It actually creates an infinity spiral, has a lot to do with the integration of polarity of the masculine and feminine within ourselves, the gold silver energy, thymus permanent seed atom of the crystal heart, atomic doorway, mouth of God, projector of light consciousness. So this has a lot to do with male female balance. And anytime anything's not balanced, just in existence, it usually attracts something that feeds on it. Um, and that is why we're so easily overtaken by parasitic vampiric systems because we are a very imbalanced culture. The Saturn moon matrix programs, the patriarchal programs have made us imbalanced as um, just on a global scale. So in our own personal world, when we begin to take a leap and take a step, sometimes the psychic attack is so bad that we have to kind of shield ourselves and create an optimal space for us to be able to move through it. And what is key also is to not take it personally because sometimes we loop in um, the attack energy when we begin to think we're failing or, oh, I thought I was doing my spiritual path correctly and something's wrong with me. I'm not doing it right. And why is everything out to get me? And, and uh, you just have to just keep breathing through it and keep trusting yourself. And um, when I did the biofeedback, the only thing that cleared energy from my space was saying F you real loud. It was so funny. I'm like, oh, that's the magic word. <laughs> anyway, but that worked for me. I just had to magic share that. <laughs> the magic word. I don't know about it should be a keeper as a magic word, but anyway, <laughs> get this off my, my blocks. <laughs> Sorry about this. So anybody want to jump in? I'm just going to try and get this off my screen. My mouse isn't working. Any other thoughts on that? Or we can move to the next question. Is there any? I love it. I love how much you're going into the body because so much of what so many people seem to be suffering with is a lack of connection to their body. You know, the, the many things that we're taught, like, oh, go exercise. And that, like, you know, it provides a connection to the body. But what everybody here is talking about is really embodiment and getting to know yourself on what appears to be a completely different dimension. But it's really just dimensions of ourselves that we're not that familiar with because we haven't been taught to, you know. So I love how everybody's emphasizing that here. Awesome. Any other thoughts on this question? And there's more questions. I wonder if Elena noticed that last question, who created the AI that created the matrix and what are the archons? Did you notice that question, Elena? Do you? <laughs> no, I didn't notice. Uh, I don't know. I don't see the <laughs> I don't um, know. It's, it, there's many levels of that and AI. Well, AI, it's technology, you know. So, yeah, it's, um, 
it's it's um, uh, artificial con- consciousness. Uh, it's so it has been created by a civilization who has the technology to do that, and it can be different people. So that's that's what I believe. I feel because we're in a free will universe, it, it becomes a mirror and reflection because AI mimics and imitates. It can't create on its own, so all it can do is mimic and imitate. And I feel some yeah. of the yeah. Uh, conditions of uh, the differentiation of the masculine and feminine and the fallen races um, and the differentiation that like ended up becoming more about duality and the war between service to self and service to others opened up some sort of portal and infection that produced these gruesome creatures as they harness the mother womb in order to generate and manifest this. So the Sophianic stuff kind of goes into it. That's all I'll say. <laughs> I mean, knowing the difference between AI and ensoulment eventually yes. may determine how, whether we succeed as a race, the AI is a problem in, galactically, it's true. Yes. And the way Johann Fritz describes the origin of the black goo AI is highly mm-hmm. parasitic and very dangerous with the yes. Draco. So AI can yeah. be a serious issue. That doesn't mean it's either good or bad inherently, but the intent behind it, as with the black goo, was, was, was very negative and dangerous. So once we realize there can never be a ghost in a machine in that the dielectric is not correct. A spirit will never inhabit a computer and a computer will never have a soul. Then we can begin to decide the direction for our children actually. So knowing the difference between AI and how you get a soul is literally the difference between that and immortality. So I think having a question about AI here is actually useful. As far as the archons, there are many legends. One is that the higher uh, Draco, the uh, the archangels, the archon saw the higher branch of the Dracar, whom Elena calls the Siakar, who Michael Helios called in the same years ago, actually. Um, and there's a white queen. Uh, they, many people believe that's who the archon referred to. But the high Draco recognize interstellar plasma beings themselves. It is understood yeah. that, as Elena mentioned, there's a species that they're actually afraid of as well. So the, these. Oh, yeah intelligences are very large. I also feel yeah. archons being, uh, meaning rulers are, are the ones that are like in charge of what's under the net, under the matrix. They are kind of blocking us from true source, zero point unified field. And so archons are rulers, but the mind parasites connected to them has a lot to do with the mind control and the manipulation of the planetary grid network and our DNA in order to make us hosts to these archonic forces and entities so that we are like, um, in such a low frequency that we keep generating loose for them to feed on as long as we're existing under this net, you know? Um, and uh, artificial intelligence, I feel, can just be cured with the truth frequency because once we're living in our truth, anything artificial, it, it, we're not hospitable for it to be able to invade us because yes. only us being fake or us being indoctrinated or running a subpersonality is going to make us susceptible for that level of intrusion, I feel. And, and there might be a thought about the origin of the term An in Archon from Anu, meaning sun god. And yet, and the clairvoyants have seen clearly the plasma heart of the sun. They call it Anu. And uh, so many times, like Anunnaki means they were wannabes. They wanted to be sun gods. Namely, they wanted to have plasma big enough to inhabit a star, which, by the way, my Kundalini teacher, Bentoff, did, actually. Uh, you know, felt the earth and then felt the sun as a living body and see through the center of the sun as an eyeball. So it's true. You don't grow up until you become a sun god in every religion reflected that. And that's who Anu is, the Ark of Anu. So many times these terms have a beautiful origin and then they're usurped by the wannabes. Like Yahweh at, in the Orion sector meant a double plasma cone. It was a beautiful thing. But when Enlil took the term Yahweh, it was not a beautiful thing. So the wannabes take over. So, but the, the heart of the term Anu in Archon is actually a beautiful concept the plasma heart of the sun. Wow. So an, mean, an, an mean source, isn't it? Well, see, an, that's beautiful. An, an, anu source, source and sun heart is the same thing. And the heart of the sun, seven spins, five outside, five spins inside, as seen by the clairvoyance of the sun, is precisely the plasma symmetry of the human heart and the heart of hydrogen. They all have exactly the same. And the reason yeah. is simple, seven spins, tetracube, and five spins. So it's a perfect slip knot, actually. Yeah. Just real quick, but it, and, and if anybody else has any thoughts on this, also when we step down in dimensional energies, some of these higher uh, groups or councils um, 
still maintain that higher self, just like we do as humans, we might live in our lower self, but ultimately we're here to integrate higher into lower so that we're not so um, polarized. But the Thothian energy, the Archangel Michael energy, a lot of the, uh, uh, what, what was what at one time beneficial ended up not being, particularly at the end of the um, Atlantean, final Atlantean cataclysm and the emergence of Aleister Crowley and something happened with the Emerald tablets and the Thothian stuff that isn't all dark, but there is like a dark shadow aspect to some of these beings as they are in lower density or par participate in lower density. Just had to add that. I don't know what you think about that. And then I'll be quiet because I, I know you guys haven't said anything in a little while, but what are your thoughts on that? If you want to say anything, Dan or Elena, since we're before, you know, it's like, it's like the, um, the imposters, I guess that uh, the, the higher self of a certain being can be hijacked by imposters. Like the Orion group is an imposter behind the whole Yahweh thing. And what happened with, you know, how it controlled even the Mekizadex and um, the Judaism and a lot of well-intentioned people that just started getting distorted teachings and got further and further away from even, and, and the mother energy just not even being able to be present um, until recently uh, had a lot to do with that because the Saturn moon matrix and the patriarchal part of it all created this sort of false king of tyranny archetype that kind of seemed to lose connection with that original sort of higher self that we're learning to make sure we don't lose connection with as humans, I guess. Well, Elena does a nice talk about the dangers of channeling and, and hearing the, the, the false beings pretending. And I, I, that was very useful from Elena, I thought. that The term Melchizedek came from Mag Zidak, a Mag and Tak, the Mag were the queens of Orion called Tak. And uh, the order of Melchizedek it has an Orion origin as well, actually. Cool. Anybody else have any thoughts? Or we can shift gears? Or I don't want to cut you off, Elaine, if you had any final words about it or... Oh, no, don't get me started no. about all the no. predators <laughs> hanging around and stuff. I, we're here tomorrow, so I'll... <laughs> I always yeah, see uh, the no, campfire where we're all telling stories. Go ahead, Aggie. Yeah, Nori and I have a radio show, a broadcast team alpha coming up here shortly. So uh, we have to go to take care of the guests and make sure our microphones work and stuff. So oh, no. Oh, sorry. We, we put more attention on you before uh, we continue with the conversation. I really appreciate you both so much. Any final words or anything you want to say? Nori, you are muted. <laughs> Massive gratitude, just such an honor to be present and to share this rarefied air with all of you. So grateful. Thank you for letting me be part of it. Thank you for all your contributions. I'm so grateful. Thank it's you. so incredible to be with you. I look forward to doing more in the future. It's just always amazing to be in your presence and hear what you have to share and it's just been so wonderful. I've, it's, it's totally shifted me this conference. I, I, that's why we do this, right? We all want to shift each other and just yes. remind each other. Yeah. Um, so Charnel is here. If we could get her, I, I don't see how I can add people for some reason. I got it. She's coming in right now. Nice. Okay. See you later. Bye, Bye Aggie. 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 Thank you. Bye. One moment, Aggie. I just want to like here right now publicly give you so much gratitude for just coming together with this. I mean, um, thank you so much for everything you do, brother. And it's been such a pleasure just working with you and creating these events. Um, you and Laura, I just, we got a lot more in store for us in the future. So just my heart goes out to you. I appreciate you so much. Yes. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. You're incredible. And it's been wonderful to be with you again and definitely looking forward to more. Yeah. And hi, Charnel. Hey, hey, and bye, Aggie. Thank you. I guess you're bye leaving. Bye. I'm getting here and you're leaving. <laughs> Timing too. It's like, it's so, so funny too. It's live. We're just so casual. Like we're sitting around the living room. Yeah. At least I feel like that. Um, so any, uh, it sounds like you're about to say something, Dan. Well, I just say it's getting pretty late here. I just wanted to say thank you and appreciate it. I'm particularly glad to meet Elena there. I really admire. Yes. Oh my God. We need to talk. <laughs> yes. I look forward to that. Really. It was wonderful. <laughs> And, and thank you, everybody. Happy this year. Blessings. Blessings. Nice to meet you. <laughs> Sweet dreams. You as well. Awesome. So we're uh, just checking out questions. Um, how uh, and why did Tiamat explode? I can share uh, just a few words on that, unless somebody wants to go first. Um, 
I'll just kind of go for it. Uh, Tiamat is a Sophionic planet. It is also known as the Dragon Queen, and it existed in the Tara uh, system, a higher harmonic universe connected to dimensions four, five, and six. Um, and again, take this with a grain of salt, but this is what my research has shown and what my intuition has guided me to understand about it. Um, there's mythologies that talk about the balance of Tiamat and Apsu, which represented the sacred union um, in the universe, basically. And so something about Marduk and Nibiru and just sort of this whole kind of drama unfolding in this free will universe that led to the explosion of Tiamat. Um, and there was also a very advanced race of beings that were seated um, in the Tara system that uh, relate to the original Atlantis Lemuria before we had root races and cloister races. And uh, so when Tiamat exploded, it really messed up the whole balance of the masculine and feminine. And when we dropped down into this lower density and part of Tiamat became Malduk and the earth, when Malduk exploded, that was the next level of another shattering of this balance of the masculine and feminine to the point where um, they really were able to take advantage of us because we began to lose our abilities and our direct connect with source. And so the fragments of Tiamat and Malduk make up the asteroid belt, Malduk being 3D and Tiamat being 5D. So when we look at all the bits of the asteroid belt, um, they do represent archetypes and there's a lot of stories within those uh, asteroids uh, so that we can rebuild our fragmented consciousness and become whole again. Um, which has to do with upgrading our DNA as well. And this healing process has to do with recovering from these exploded planets. Because when you exist on a planet that explodes, your consciousness and the trauma that you experience is all a part of that. And it being a Sophionic planet, it created the Akamoth, it brought in the Akamoth. Um, and that womb energy got harnessed and the dark mother reversals came in and then the worship of the Baphomet, the denial of the mother or the demonization or misrepresentation of her or only certain stories and not the full picture of the goddess energy ended up being what we've been dealing with. And that's all changing. So I'll just leave it at that. Anybody else? Yeah. That was awesome. Yeah. You're a cosmic alchemist. <laughs> I think too much. No. <laughs> I know. I just love how we all just merge our information and there's, you know, I learned so much from you guys and, and then I have certain specialties that I've put a lot of attention on. And um, that one was uh, an interesting one. And there's, it's never ending. It's never ending. It's so crazy that we don't have access to any of this kind of information in our school systems or growing up. It's like, it never happened. It's so weird. It's like, coming. I know. I know. Um, okay. So, uh, and the cool thing is that we're all a part of this alchemizing process and especially missions like all of you uh, being the sort of the guiding principle of this alchemical shift to turn it around. Um, it's fun to surf it with you all. Okay. Um, I don't see any questions. Anything you want to bring to the table, Charnel? Any thoughts from any of you guys? Just, you know, just lunge forward and say something if you like. Uh, or introduce a question to the group or any any share. And if anybody else has any questions that are still a part of um, the events, we got the Q&A open still. Dr. Charnel, since you just came, I'd love to hear from you. I don't know what you guys have been talking about. So I feel like I just like jumped into the back end of you guys saying goodbye to everybody. So I was like, wait a minute. <laughs> That okay, happened to me too, so I can't oh, okay. so. I'm, I'm running the event and I had to step away. I got in like 15 minutes ago. <laughs> but let's, I guess the question is, because we're going to close up pretty soon here. What next? <laughs> right? What, what is, what is next? Like we, I, yesterday I feel was so amazing. We went into so many details on tools and techniques, right? That we offer everybody today we're kind of talking about like the dynamics of you know the structure of this matrix you know and um we've already really discussed how we like tools that we can do to really restructure this matrix but maybe you just want to riff on that a little bit and just we can go go around after that and just do our closing thoughts for the It'd whole be great conference for everybody to share something on that um Real quick, just a quick question to answer. This is from a friend. What's up with the Baphomet and butterfly symbolism in Hollywood? Butterfly symbolism in Hollywood, I would say, has to do with the monarch programming and Baphomet being the dark mother reversals is a, a satanic um, just uh, uh, manipulation to harvest and siphon uh, life force uh, and feed um, 
this, you know, kind of dark mother denying the true essence of the Sophia mother energy. Anybody else? Um, okay, so so uh, go, going back to you, Neil, we're not going to take any more questions. We're just going to go around. Um, okay, yep, we're good with the questions. So Neil, I'm so sorry. Just if you could just reiterate, we're going to close the questions and answers down. We're going to go around and what, like what next? So who, you want to go first or who, who do you think? Or we'll go, um, we'll, I'll go last and I'll, I'll close it out, but Dr. Okay. Sharnel can go first. Yeah. Awesome. Awesome. So okay. for me, um, anything nature, I think we all agree. Definitely. Um, laughing for no reason, having fun for no reason, um, doing the things that make you happy for sure. Animals are really high frequency as we discussed dolphins and horses might be a little bit um, more difficult to have access to at times, but um, cats per at uh, 186 megahertz and, uh, and then dogs are just, they just are magnificent. And so we got that going for us. Definitely essential oils, crystals, high five diet for sure. Anything that doesn't have chemicals or MSG or any of the uh, GMOs, that kind of thing, being in sunlight, getting outside in the sun, definitely grounding sand, dirt, grass, all those things, you know, being in nature, like I mentioned, being by the water is really important. Or even if you can't be in the water, be by the water and, or even like showers or magnesium baths are really, really important. Red light therapy, all the other like frequency machines, as far as hyperbaric chamber, sauna, uh, infrared sauna, rife, biofeedback, uh, gosh, um, foot detoxes, you know, there's just so many. Float uh, therapy. Have you ever tried that Dr. Chanel? What's float that? Therapy. Have you ever tried float therapy? Oh my gosh. Float yes. Tank. Float tank. I don't like the dry float tank. I like the real, the right, the regular float tank. Um, also cryotherapy. I do that a couple times a week. You can get IVs like Meyer cocktails, high vitamin C, um, D3, so yeah, um, there's so many, you know, things that physical things that we, you know, have like a floating, I mean, a, a, a device that you can just put on your wrist or your, your uh, ankle when you're sleeping for grounding purposes. If you can't get to nature, maybe you're in like cement jungle, wherever city. Um, but yeah, um, lots of ways that you can just put things in your house and to, you know, to keep things grounded. And you know what? Friends are really important being around a good community, um, conscious thinking, conscious speaking, you know, being aware of your surroundings and what you're thinking about, talking about, um, things that you're looking at, listening to, you know, turn down the news, you know, Elena spoke, uh, uh, we've, we've done several conferences together, Elena and Laura and I, and actually Seth too, but, um, Elena, you, you said this and I still think about it is fear is consent. And I always credit you with that because that, um, that quote is like lingers in my existence. It's like, it was such a big deal. And then here recently, my dream about being immortal, like there's something huge about this, um, uh, remembering that we cannot die there is no such thing so so if we can remember that we are immortal we are the immortals we are the eternals just like the the i guess there's another movie coming out called the eternals but um you know when we live in that there is no death there is only life and that is our focus then what's there to be afraid of you know it's just like we're here we're born for this for now in this season and your job, our job is to shine and to just be, and to remember that God DNA is in us projecting. And when we, we stay in that alignment of God beaming out of us and only thinking what God would think, only speaking what God would think, only listening to what God would listen to. And just really, really, you know, kind of just immersing ourselves with what God would do. And, and I don't mean it like, what would Jesus do? I'm not talking about religion. I'm talking about the projection of the God DNA that we were born into and, and, and even visualizing that and, and everywhere we go, knowing I ignite Christ consciousness and everyone I contact and that being my only truth and belief. And I am alive in that. Then you have 
things that come back to you that you will get a match to and you will everywhere you go ignite miracles because that is your inheritance that is my inheritance and that is what we are here to do is to bring heaven on earth to be heaven on earth and to stay in love not just for a minute but to stay in the vibration of christ consciousness who is love and beam that out beautiful <laughs> Who would like to go next? Or do you want to, how about you, Elena? Well, I'm wonderful words. I'm still like, wow. <laughs> well, my words would be, uh, it is time we take our destiny in hands and stop giving our power away to whatever it is, religion, government, state, um, it is, um, it is take care of it problems what what we can't deal with okay because we don't have the technology but us humans we need to take care of human stuff the planet human species ourselves and grow up stop kneeling standing up and so people can can feel lost because we've been conditioned from millenniums to to just kneel and obey and live in fear you know humans need to remember the power of creativity because creativity is survival. So, you know, um, I've experienced that myself. I've been living in, um, in Egypt where nothing ever works how, how you want. <laughs> so the thing is, I've learned how not to rely as much as possible, not to rely on someone else. As much as possible, rely on yourself then you, you, you remove the problems, you remove the obstacles. Try to rely as most, m much as possible on yourself, not to depend on anyone else. And when you do that, suddenly you freak out because you're confronted <laughs> like a big boy or a big girl to the problems. And what happens? Creativity, survival instincts, creativity. And suddenly, oh, you come up with solutions. And that happens. And suddenly you take confidence in yourself because you discover you can, you f human being is full of resources and creativity. Everyone has creativity, but sometimes it's when we are confronted to the problem that suddenly creativity happens by survival. So we can all do that. And it's time we do it. We, we do what we can to improve the world around us a little bit, you know, if everyone does its bit around themselves, it changed the world, you know that. So um, that would be my message. Take your power in hands. It's time we take our destiny in hands and um, let's go for it. <laughs> awesome, Elena. Thank you so much for being a part of this event. It's just been so incredible. My um, pleasure. And of course, Dr. Sean, I'll you, man, totally. So grateful that you've been a part of this as well and um we're all going to be creating more and how about you seth and then i'll go and then neil and and we'll say good night oh my oh, god okay but it's, yeah, it's like so beautiful you guys like, okay go ahead everything here has been so great i'm so happy now i want to take what charnel and elena said and emphasize to everybody the importance of that because it, it's very much like the stuff that we got to do for ourselves that nobody else is going to do. And as a result of doing that, you would be amazed at what can happen as a result of doing it. Like I live in Maine. Okay. And for those, some, some people never even heard of it. You know, it's up in the Northeast of the U S it's surrounded by woods. It's just in the woods. We have a community of people up here that is thriving. When I say thriving, I'm talking like, there's almost 3000 members strong. Every week we have these huge meetings in every county of the state. This weekend, we're having a massive event. There'll probably be three or 400 people at it. And literally all people who realize everything that's happening, they're like, no, no. We're gonna create new systems. We're gonna create new ways of being. and. I'm blown away because I never thought this would happen here of all places in the world. I am, I've made more friends in the past year than I've ever had in my entire life. And 
you know, it started with Dr. Northrup. Dr. Christian Northrup lives a couple towns over from me. And everybody's like, you got to meet her. You got to go there. I met her and her daughter. And just seeing how all these people are coming together with open hearts and open minds and accepting each other. I mean, we've got right wing fundamental Christians all the way to barefoot dancing in the sand hippies, all embracing each other, all accepting one another, all like, okay, we might think and look different and talk different, but we're really referencing the same thing and we all know it. And so bit by bit, we're all creating, or I should say we are experiencing the creation of new states of being through us because things will happen we'll be like okay we're going to focus our energy and we're going to do something and these synchronicities will happen and we'll be like oh my god i can't believe it it's amazing and then just having that high level of like anything is possible creates new things so bit by bit we become more coherent as a community even the word community community immunity unity when people truly get together with open hearts and they love each other unconditionally or at least they can hold space and they let the triggers and the wounding and the stuff that usually makes repels us from others you just look at that as an opportunity to teach you how to rise above it you start doing that collectively as a group and this is happening up here in maine and it's crazy, you know, because Dr. Northrop, they write these articles about her. You can type it up. And, you know, she was Reader's Digest, 12 most respected people in America. And now she's part of the disinformation dozen. They call her a domestic terrorist. And it's like, I know this woman really. She's like the most loving, beautiful soul you could ever met. Like, it, so it just goes to show like, and everyone here, it's, it's a joke. Like, we're laughing at it because all these systems of control that are scaring the hell out of people are attacking people like Christian Northrup, who's like, so when you see, you know, cause we're all in it up here and we're seeing, we're watching firsthand. We're like, oh my God, they've got nothing left. If they've resorted to that, like it's like name calling essentially. Who's, who hasn't grown up? Who hasn't recognized that they have a universal soul existing within them and that it's our inalienable right to be conscious of that and interact with each other in a way that reinforces and inspires each other's remembrance of that? We're doing that up here. And the whole world, everything that's happening in the world is gearing us up to be doing this together, all of us. Like we're all placed in different parts of it but essentially we're all doing the same thing you know and so for me what's next is uh, this is what's happening you know it's it's what you guys said got to do the inner work the inner work is like it no matter what but where it goes from there is the potential for these really beautiful powerful communities that have solutions to every single problem that is being projected by society. So, wow, wow, really, wow. I'm just in a state of like, oh, thank God, you know. Oh, that's so awesome. Yeah. It's been so wonderful to be with you. I'll share my little bit, if that's cool, Neil. Thank you, so Seth, so much. Uh, your friendship and just all that we've been doing together and all that we will do, I, it just whew, makes me... Yeah. I mean, that, that to me is as a part of what's next is, is the synchronicities, the connections, the things that we're going to create. Staying creative is really important because it's so easy to get invaded by what's coming at us from outside of us that when it infects our creative channels, um, we can tell something's wrong, but sometimes it's not easy to release that unless we align with a vision, a goal, or a dream. I've been saying that a lot sort of redundantly lately, but truth is a muscle, just like intuition that needs to be built um, that it can atrophy. It, it's always there, but it's either really small and not being paid attention to, or it can be really big where, okay, our intuition is strong or higher guidance is there. You're walking in your truth. And w w when you do that and you see the results of what it does to your life, what it does to your health, 
it's a little bit easier to let go of the people that might not be able to handle it, that might not uh, want to live in their own truth. Because when we live in our truth frequency, we don't want others to live our truth. We hope that they'll live their truth. And in holding this sovereignty and respect for one another with mutual love and respect and integrity, our differences um, are a blessing because we're not going to be arguing over belief systems, which is very much the deep state tactics. So if you think that something needs to happen, if you're frustrated and you're just like, why isn't this happening? And I live here and I feel alone and nobody's coming together. It might be that you're the one to create that. Very often the things that make us depressed and angry or I don't know, overly thinking, um, your, your calling or your greater mission is trying to get your attention. Doesn't mean it's always easy to step into, but you can always put out the word and see who else might be in agreement. Leadership in this day and age is a lot different than the old paradigm model, which is dying. A lot of people are kind of dying with it. They have a chance to always be reborn, of course. But the new leadership of these times, I feel, is be true to yourself, be genuine, authentic, be real with the process and the heartbreak even. You know, don't be ashamed of it, but, you know, um, try and move through it as best as possible, especially those lower frequencies that I was showing uh, on the power versus, or the, the Hawkins scale that I share in pretty much most presentation these days. Um, let's not judge the humanness of it all, but let's work with it and, and give it unconditional love and, and understanding so that we can turn it into our greater potential. If we're feeling grief, regret, and any kind of pain, there's something on the other side of the coin, something on the other side of coin of depression and anger as well. Soul longing, passion, inspiration that um, we could be standing uh, in alignment with or moving in the direction of to, to uh, bring more of it into our life uh, is always an option. When we don't take that step, it literally eats us alive and it literally shuts us down. Um, and that's where stagnation can also be a uh, reason for the body to create disease. Um, mind control, social engineering as well. Sometimes the false light can sustain one for a while, but then it eventually catches up with itself. Truth is everything. Live your truth. Take the time to feel into what you're going through. Um, detox all that you can. Shut all the electronics down every once in a while and just be in the now as much as possible. It's so easy to be like in the future, in the past. And that's fine because we tend to process, but give yourself a break to just be in the now and call your energy back and, and really anchor in what your intent is, what your goals are, what your visions are, and really make sure that you infuse your creative channels with that on a consistent basis. We have a new moon on Thursday. That's a really good opportunity, especially with uh, sun, moon being in Scorpio opposite Uranus. There is a squared aspect to Saturn. That's not always fun, but that pressure, that pressure of control and tyranny um, is producing something if we allow it. Uh, it's helping us to reclaim our treasures. Uh, so just know that in the face of adversity, um, this is where we can reclaim our power. And I just want to share one quick thing. Uh, I hope that's okay. This yeah, is what's coming up. This is what's coming up that is so important to embrace that I shared in the conference. We're entering uh, Ephiakis seasons. The themes connected to Ephiakis are unification and wound healing. The dates are November 30th to December 17th. It's right uh, in between Scorpio Sagittarius. And so it's, a, it's, it's the ether purification that is now available and it hasn't really been available until recently, 2010, uh, when the sun started to move through the 13th sign. It, it relates to Creatrix connectivity, pure transparent crystalline light, divine mother, and the cleansing power of cosmic love, recoding the DNA, aligning to the cosmic heart of Lyra and Andromeda universal center, rebirthing, cleansing the blood, breath, and mitochondria. So when you think of all the things that people are going through, blood clots, unable to breathe, this and that, there's, there's a lot of resistance in reconnecting to the mother and healing the mitochondrial DNA because it's been damaged for so long and all the distortions have made it very difficult. So the very thing that is going to change it all for the better and transform us is what people are, are very much in resistance of because of the fear of death. When we embrace death and the transformation process, we'll begin to realize um, something truly profound is happening on a planetary and cosmic level. Uh, Ophiuchus, uh, Chiron rules Ophiuchus, which has to do with wounds, the uh, wounded healer. And when we can honestly face our wounds, we're able to really access the ether energies, the, the higher 
uh, energies of source, uh, unconditional love of the mother and really, really purify. So this window is hugely important. December 6th to 9th, uh, the great attractor, uh, it's 14 degrees Sagittarius and it relates to an amping up of our manifestation abilities on a massive level. November 19th to 23rd, uh, we move through the galactic center uh, and on the other side of the um, great attractor of the Milky Way is the Andromeda Galactic Core. So there are extraordinary things. Maybe, you know, replay this and read the rest. Uh, I, I just want to kind of end it. But okay, wait, real quick. This phase is the solar alignment when the cosmic ether, which is at the core of the galactic center, which represents pouring of healing spiritual waters into the earth and humanity from Mother God. Previously, these waters were corrupted by entrapping the Mother Principle, Baphomet, and gold ray seraphim on earth, capable of healing fallen angels, brings light to light the resurrection uh, as it resides between Scorpio and Sagittarius. We all can die and resurrect. Let's not fear death. Let's release everything that doesn't serve us, be willing to rise in these times, embrace the fullness of all that we are, take off the mask, speak your truth, and um, don't worry about what anybody thinks. You know, you're gonna be a being of love anyway. <laughs> if they don't like it, whatever. Beautiful. Thank you so, so much, Laura. Thank you so much, everybody. Um, I'm so happy with the way this event went. Just like it was really uplifting for myself. And and I know that a lot of people just checking out the YouTube and all the comments here, a lot of people got, you know, a lot out of this. And so many people came here through synchronicity. And it's really, like I said, right at the beginning, this event was an activation. This is an upliftment of consciousness, not just information. You know, it's it's what do we do now and how can we create harmony within our lives and for the entire planet, right? So I and I want to just bring it all together right here because it was so many beautiful points that you all made as you're doing your closing statements. And I took notes to just really bring it full circle. And then I'm going to end with um, two back-to-back -back poems um, on Mother Earth because we're going to bring it down to earth, you know, but um, it was expressed a couple of times here that, you know, through basically through what we've noticed throughout human history, at least documented history last few thousand years, is that from great adversity comes extreme innovation and creativity, right? And we've been in this time of great adversity, you know, even if you're having a good time, a lot of people aren't. And it's taken uh, us to the point that we've had to come up with innovative ideas just to be right? Humanity is so incredibly beautiful. Like the things that we can do and what the, the creativity that we can express and the, the range of experiences that we're able to feel in this free world world is just beautiful to me. That I've, I've also noticed that, you know, a lot of people that become the masters of something, right? Let's just say that they, they become a, a therapist or a rehab, um, you know, work in rehab or anything. Most of those individuals, right, have actually been on the other end of it. You know, like, for example, do you want to do you want to um, maybe get some therapy from someone who just has book smart and went to college or someone that maybe was a drug addict and then figured out how not to be it and now is teaching you the ways, you know, so all these challenges and adversities that we've had have really given us the opportunity to transcend. Dr. Charnel, you put your hand up. Do you want to comment on that? I was just agreeing. Oh, yeah. I was just saying that's a. I mean, there's nothing that beats experience. Trumps mm -hmm. tr experience trumps everything. Right, and that's why we're here. We're here to experience. You know, Source wanted to experience itself infinitely, and now we're here experiencing ourselves in such a beautiful way. And um, just to go back here to, okay, so one aspect is something that really uh, stood out to me when I went to a Bashar channeling a long time ago was something called the rubber band effect. You know, like when you basically the level of consciousness is you might go into duality, 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 but when you learn these lessons, the rubber band effect is that you let go of the rubber band and then you just like jump into this evolution of consciousness. And what I feel that this duality has represented has been the separation from our connection. The not we've never really truly separated, but the belief that we have are right. And then acting upon it. And now that we've got to that point, there's no way to go but up. <laughs> so like, let's, so to me, I'm really hopeful. It's inevitable. Scriptures talk about it. You know, there's even dating in like the, in this Vedic scriptures of the dates of our evolutions at different levels, right? It's happening. It's going to happen. And all we got to do is just keep moving forward and keep ourselves centered. So I hope that you've got some tools and techniques from this experience of the last two days that can help you with that. Just a couple of, of more pointers for myself is 
you know, we had a question yesterday that someone said that he was in a funk. Surround yourself with what harmonizes you, right? Um, utilize the modalities that are available to you, right? I used to put on just, um, I had like five crystal, um, what do they call it? Um, Himalayan salt lamps in one room at one point, <laughs> just walk right into it. And, you know, just the, the negative ions from that just neutralizes the whole air and you just feel it. So there's so many tools available to you. Use what you need and keep yourself centered in that place so that we don't come from a place of um, triggered emotions and, and reactions, but we come from a place of understanding and acceptance because we're all just trying to figure it out. You know, we they don't, none of us have all the answers. And even if we do, that could just be one layer of one dimension of awareness. Who knows how far it really goes? You know, maybe this is just one construct within this karmic cycle in this galaxy, right? So there's so many layers that we're going to unfold. And it's about, and again, I said a quote from the Rig Veda earlier. Here's another quote. It's, it's not the destination, but it's the journey that counts, you know? So as long as we remember that and we own that, then we won't have to be in fear about being present in this moment and waiting for something like, well, when will we ascend? When will we be in this world, right? The only way we're going to create that paradoxical reality is by being present in the now, right? It's so interesting how this works. The universe works on a paradox. And it's not about knowing the paradox, it's just accepting that that's what it is, you know? Um, okay, did I have anything else I wanted to share? <laughs> I'm, uh, can I just say one thing? If you're in a funk, yeah, go for it. know that you're funky and do the funky dance. Just <laughs> funk out. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Just express it through your creativity, through your dance, whatever you need to do, you know? All right. And on that note, everybody, thank you all so much. Love you very much. I'm just going to do these poems right here. Um, the first one's called Days of Origin, and then the other one's called Mother Earth. And these are pretty new. I only wrote them within the last year. Here we go. Since the days of origin of human mindset, the first day before others was set into motion, movement is not as we believe. We perceive steps being taken, rhymes are breaking, minds that were shaking by the earth when we began to turn the other way. Another way, is there another way to play this game? Is there another way to play this game? The fossilized bones become rocks, maimed forever, injured and ashamed, victimized and blamed. I'm the definition of crazed but it's the only way I can think of other ways to restructure this maze so we can escape the delusion we create, the energy of hate as we despise each other, forget that we are brothers and sisters, disrespected the mother earth, we forgot her worth. Earth, we forgot her worth. Earth, we forgot her worth. Earth gave humanity from out of the birth. Mother earth. This right here, everybody goes out to one of the manifestations of source. The north sky, it reflects light on my porch. The entire planet is my church. Even when she is scorched, mother nature will nourish and replenish the soil so that mankind can reap the spoils, abundance, creation and destruction, the Kali Ma personification manifesting on this plane in the form of all life, married to father sky. Our minds remain fertile, earth in the back of a turtle, the Nephilim reversal and generations of persecution, nemesis, brings retribution. And Ishtar's contribution are the flowers that bloom, the life that we once knew. She is the one who provides unconditional love to you. As we move over her surface, I dedicate these verses. She is always of service. Time to give back. Time to bring it back. The wounded feminine is where we've been at, but also the wounded man. The divine aspect ran away from our place a millennia ago. Patriarchy and damaged egos took over this world. Now is the moment to bring back the days of old. The divine feminine has been on hold, but never truly left. This energy transcends gender as we bark on this quest to remember our nest. Before we were born, she blessed you and me, you and me. But who are we? An illustration of beauty and art displayed in the cosmos for all of those who pass us to see and admire. She is the fire, the water, the wind, and the birds. All other creatures have heard her voice, her voice. Her voice sings lands into existence, providing assistance and gravitational resistance so we can continue to thrive. When we die before our souls return to the sky, we join her and become her again, the truest of friends with us until the end and rebirth. She is Mother Earth. Wow, that is just incredible, man. 
Wow, 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 wow. Thank you, Neil. Thank you, Neil. Thank you all so much. Love you guys. Such a great, Laura, you brought together some amazing people. I'm so grateful for working with you in just this event and the intention for it. So these are the three that I uh, brought forward that are here with us in this yeah, final. Know, right? <laughs> and, and you brought together incredible people in Augie and it was really great to do this with you guys. And so yeah. glad this can be replayed and thanks everybody so much for your support. And All right, everybody. Well, that's it. So the, you will get unlimited replay access. We'll be sending out the replay soon. Love you guys. Oh, yeah, go ahead. Can they still purchase even if they didn't attend yes. the last two? You can okay. purchase forever. So share it with your friends and family. Yeah, so it's like you, it's like buying a book on Amazon. It's 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 here. If you didn't attend, it, 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 the link will be in the description. So yeah, mm -hmm. I, I would definitely check this out. Awesome guys. Okay. All right. Thank Good night, everybody. So much, Thank you. Guys. Yep. Bye. Good night. Bye.